Okay, good morning, Pine Church, those of you who are here in person and also on Zoom. Oh, get back a little bit. Okay. Here, start again. Good morning, Pine Church. Today's scripture lesson comes from the uh, book of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In the 15th year of the rule of the Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea and Herod was the ruler of, of Galilee, his brother Philip was ruler over Etrea and Trachonotus, and Lysanias was ruler over Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, God's word came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. John went throughout the region of the Jordan River, calling for people to be baptized to show that they were changing their hearts and lives and wanted God to forgive their sins. This is just as it was written in the scroll of the words of Isaiah the prophet. A voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The crooked will be made straight and the rough places made smooth. All humanity will see God's salvation. Word of, word of God for the people of God. So as we come together for our collective message this morning, we're still gonna attempt to do it this way to get everybody's input and build this message as a community with one another. So um, as we enter into this time of building our message, um, let us pray. May the meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths be acceptable and pleasing to you, God, our rock and our redeemer, amen. So we continue on in our week and our season of Lent um, being the second Sunday. So last week we talked about, um, last week we focused on hope. We focused on who Jesus is and who Jesus may be to us, especially as we enter the season of Advent. What is it that we are waiting for? Who is it that we are waiting for? Who is it that we are anticipating? And how must we, um, how might we being, be called to prepare in the midst of all of that. And so um, we continue to build on that theme in today's scripture reading. So today, while we, while we talk about and focus on this theme of peace, one of the main questions is, I think as we, as people of faith, as followers of Christ, we are being called then to ask the question then, what is peace? What does peace have to do with today's reading? You know, we he re we, in our reading, we have all the, all the people being named, the emperors being named, the high priest being named as well. What does this text actually have to do with peace? Is peace present in this text? So I'm going to open it up for a conversation around this topic. What is peace? And those of you who are joining on Zoom, you could uh, use the chat box. Um, or you could use a little raise hand emoji to let me know or raise hand thingy on the bottom of Zoom to let me know that you um, have some thoughts that you would like to share. And then for those of you who are in person, feel free to just uh, come up and share as you feel moved to do so. So what is peace? What does peace have to do with today's reading? Um, is peace present in today's reading at all? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So um, from this reading, um, given the times, uh, um, I, I think most people know Herod's rule was very um, cruel, and he was not a benevolent king at all. Um, and then there's Pontius Pilate and who else is uh, in charge here? Yeah. So so I think if you look at this, this doesn't look like a time of peace. Um, likewise, right now, the times we're living in um, could not, I don't think, be described as peaceful with a recent school shooting, with uh, um, virus now mutating and more um, concerns. 
And so I think the piece, you know, what this speaks to me is the piece really has to be internal at this point. Um, that, you know, if you look for outside sources of peace and you're waiting for, I don't know, the water protectors to suddenly make a breakthrough and be able to take back their land or um, that scientists will suddenly find a cure, you know, for uh, COVID or um, gun laws will be changed so that innocent people aren't being killed, it, it seems very disheartening. And so I, I really believe the message here to me is to go internal, to find that peace within. Hey, Pine Church, can you hear me? Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to just speak regarding peace. I agree with Margaret that I think it is uh, an internal um, experience. Um, when we think about this time and we think about the years that passed after, there was really no peace. It's wars upon wars, um, countries taking over uh, imperial forces, um, moving, actually be strengthening and, and becoming more powerful. And so the peace that I take from scripture and from, I guess, God is, is really that internal peace. One thing that did come to mind today is that peace can also be an assurance um, uh, that things will be well and that we have a part in making things well. Um, and I think part of that piece, aside from the assurance, is that when we find our place in that plan and in that action to create change and to create peace, then we, we have that, that, I guess, inner, um, uh, inner peace, <laughs> that we are in the right place, we are doing the work, and that we will contribute, we contribute to ultimately what, uh, what change will look like and what, um, what peace will be. Uh, I don't know if peace will be a correct, the correct word to use here. I feel like the word serenity will be more appropriate. And when I think about serenity, it reminds me of uh, the serenity prayer uh, and I think serenity prayer it's, doesn't guarantee serenity, but it's how, uh, but more like uh, how you how you react to the changes in this world. And I think uh, the serenity prayer is pretty. Uh, it, it pretty much says it all. Grant me the yeah, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change and the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I think that's pretty much a way, uh, it, I feel like that's a way how we Christians should uh, live our life and deal with all the different changes in this world. And yes, a lot of changes are negative changes. And why, and, and it is, uh, and there's a lot of, and some of those are things that we can make a difference and we do have to make a difference. And there are some of the things that, are that we are not able to, are that too great for us to make a, a, it's something out of our controls. And we, we, can, we shouldn't be beating ourselves up over it. And uh, that's how I look at, uh, peace. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, glad to be participating in the hybrid worship. So I'll be doing hybrid here at home, and then uh, I'll be also going there live later to help out with some decorations. So it's for me, it's literally hybrid. Um, uh, when I think of peace, um, just echoing what everyone has said, um, I yeah. I think of uh, the fact that we live in a reality of empire. And as the scripture says, I mean, uh, the, this is a context of all these rulers, right? Uh, the, the oppressive political system that's going on uh, when John's lone voice in the wilderness um, came out. Um, 
So uh, peace to me, inner peace does not uh, you know, ignore the realities of the world. In fact, um, I think it's what helps us um, uh, to prepare the way, um, even in the midst of all these things. Um, so the inner serenity or inner peace or however you call it, nowadays people talk about mindfulness. And I think there's a lot to learn about how we can carve out a path by looking at some of these mindfulness techniques. Um, and so as we do that, we don't ignore um, our anxieties. We don't ignore um, these oppressive things that are happening, which is real. In fact, it helps us to be calm and present even in the midst of these things and thereby preparing us to pave a way so that real changes can happen. So I think it's not turning inward just for the sake of finding some sort of a calm, but I think it's so that it could help prepare us a way to make changes in the real world. And we can't do that unless we, have, we are collected and um, are able to face reality. And I think meditation and mindfulness can be useful to that extent. Um, in the chat box, we have May. Uh, who said that peacemaking is a process, inner and outer conflict is a part of life. We can be baptized into the community of Christ's peacemakers. And then Philip, there's an affirmation for you here uh, with from Don. I like the idea that we are part of preparing the way for real change. Um, so, but I'm, I'm always reminded that um, peace without justice not, is not really peace. And that, um, that even if someone is, um, uh, that the, that the kings and, and, the, and the aristocrats were usually had peace surrounding them, but they oppressed their servants and they oppressed women and they oppressed other people that in order to have their own peace. Um, so peace, um, is not necessarily your own if it has comes at a cost. Well, I'm a, a very practical and realistic person. So when I do things, it's habitual and I, I watch a, a lot of cable news. So I see that turmoil that goes on at high school kids shooting each other. Uh, political issues coming out just by simple act of getting a vac vaccination that becomes a, a, a political act. But I find daily I go, I swim <laughs> and then emerge my whole body in, into the water. All that turmoil and tribulation seems to subside. And I could just see clearly that things aren't that bad, that there is some inner peace within me and just the movement of my body and the floating puts me at ease. Oh, here we go. All right, Philip says, I really appreciate the camera angle that shows people who have gathered live at Pine. That is causing inner peace for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if there are uh, no other reflections to be shared in this space at this time, um, I'll share some of my reflections on today's text. I always think it's really interesting that today's text starts with the political context of the times, right? Naming the authority, naming the leadership of the Roman empire, even names the priests, right? The leaders of the temple in contrast with John the Baptist. We have John the Baptist in this text, who is the voice in the wilderness proclaiming um, a message. So it's interesting to see this whole structure, the structure of the Roman Empire, the structure of the temple in contrast with the wilderness um, and how the difference in authority that is being presented to us in that. John the Baptist. So the past few Sundays that we've been reflecting on the gospel or um, the, the good news to the poor, how this message of John the Baptist is good news to the poor, right? That's a, that's a question that, that I think we can have as people of faith. When we're talking about the gospel, what is the good news? What is the good news to the poor, to the oppressed? 
this message of preparing the way of the valleys being filled in, of hills and pathways being made straight, how is that good news for the poor? How is that the gospel? So again, this proclamation from the wilderness that John the Baptist is having is a proclamation of an overturn of the world as we know it, right? An overturn of how the world is ordered in ways that will move us towards liberation, that will move us towards genuine peace. Uh, yesterday was the anniversary of um, Black Panther, um, Fred Hampton. It was the anniversary of his assassination. And he said, he said, quote, let me just say peace to you if you're willing to fight for it. So it's been lifted up in the space of very different, or, you know, different perspectives on what peace is, how we experience peace personally, how we see peace in the world, and also our role in pursuing peace. We have been taught to give the stewardship of peace to governments. We have been taught to give stewardship of peace to Caesars, to emperors, to those that we see, celebrities even. We have, been, we have given stewardship of peace to other people except for ourselves. We are empowered in being able to have inner peace. But I think that sometimes if we're yearning for a just and lasting peace, something that's outside of ourselves, something that is external, it's difficult for us to really put our fingers on that because of the news, because of what we know is happening in the world. Fred Hampton, Fred Hampton also said, we're going to have the struggle, we're gonna to have to struggle relentlessly to bring about some peace because the people that we're asking for peace, they are a bunch of megalomaniac warmongers and they don't even understand what peace means. Our sense of peace has been distorted, especially for us in the United States. I remember after 9-11, peace was about igniting war in the Middle East. Peace was about having our authority over others around the world. Peace was about wielding our authority, was about wielding um, our agendas over other countries. That's what peace became about. For the Roman Empire, they had this agenda called Pax Romana, right, or Roman peace, peace under Rome, where they were doing similar things, where they would think that peace would come from their conquering others. Because if they're able to control other places, other things, other resources, then they can manage the world peacefully. And I think sometimes we might think this way about the United States. But Fred, Fred Hampton, that quote reminds us that we are agents of peace. We are peacemakers and that there will be struggle when it comes to peace. Our text reminds us that we are called to live into peace. We are called to prepare the way. We are called to take an active part in midwifing liberation into this world. We are reminded too in today's text that God's word came to John in the wilderness. It didn't come from him being in a synagogue or at temple it didn't come through the, the scribes or the priests, right? The people who are assigned to be the ones to speak on peace. John the Baptist had received God's word in the wilderness, outside of all of those structures, outside of all of those things that he would traditionally be taught what peace is. For John the Baptist and his people's history, the wilderness is a place of his people wrestling with their relationship with God after having been liberated from slavery in Egypt. The wilderness is a place of wandering. The wilderness is a place where some people don't make it out, not even Moses himself. And yet, this is the place where John the Baptist finds the word from God. And we know in the story uh, that Jesus, after being baptized, later goes to the wilderness before he goes out into the ministry um, of his that we know. So the wilderness was not necessarily a peaceful place. It might be a place of contradictions, where it is away from the oppressive conquerors, where it is away from the structure of empire. And at the same time, there's a lot of unknown, there's uncertainty. This is where God's word comes to John the Baptist. John being able to think outside of the structures and even live outside of the structures for, allows him to help prepare the path for a new way of being, a new way, 
not the way of Caesar, not the way of empires, not the way of Rome, not the way of high priests, but a way determined, still determined to upend the landscape that we are used to. The gospel good news to the poor is repentance. This way of preparation through repentance, a turning back towards God, a turning back towards remembering that there is a system that is much larger than the ones that have been imposed on us in our world. It is a radical shift, repentance, a radical shift that requires us to live life in the wilderness and to find peace in the midst of it. To midwife, liberation is not guaranteed that we will always be in the optimal conditions. It doesn't mean that we're going to always be prepared. But midwifing means that there will be struggle. Wherever there is midwifing, there is struggle there. And it's also a place where new beginnings will come. So when we're talking about peace, whether it's external peace or whether it's inner peace, I think that the two are related. Our inner peace, whether you want to say it's our assurance or serendipity or even clear or clarity of mind, those things can contribute to the way we live into peace outside of ourselves. And the hope is that we are alert and awake enough to see those small places where we can push for change towards peace, those small places where we can be peacemakers in this world. So peace is not without struggle. And our text reminds us of that. Peace will not be without struggle. The context of John the Baptist where he was preaching peace was not one that was without struggle. That would be a false sense of peace. We as people of faith, we're called to live into a peace that is the result of wholeness. We know the word peace as shalom, and that means a peace that is a result of wholeness, a result of justice, a result of healing, a result of dignity. It is a just and lasting peace. And so I hope for us as people of Pine, as we move through the rest of the season of Advent, we can really discern for ourselves and reflect on where are those places that we can move peace forward, whether it's within ourselves that we may gain clarity, that we may gain assurance or hope that others are participating in ways that we have yet to discern, or whether it's us taking more active steps in building communities of peace, communities where we can discern peace and live into peace with one another. I hope that this season brings us those moments. Thank you.